Managing your blood sugar is incredibly important for a lot of different reasons. If you are somebody who is healthy, this is something you still need to be concerned about. In today's podcast, we are going to talk about some of the dangers of having a high blood sugar, some of the best diet practices that you can be following to hopefully alleviate any potential issues from high blood sugar, and of course, some blood sugar hacks that you can follow every single day to quickly lower your blood sugar and allow you to enjoy all the bountiful uh, things that life has to offer without having to worry about managing your overall diabetes symptoms. So um, we got a lot of great information today. And before we get into that, I just wanna make sure that you like and subscribe to our channel. We help individuals of all abilities improve their overall health and knowledge of the gym. And the first thing that I wanted to talk about in our podcast today is just some of the general symptoms that you might be having if you are having some complications from high blood sugar. So there could be a lot of different things going on. You might be wondering, how in the world am I going to even notice this to begin with? Okay. So to begin, let's just start by talking about what are some normal blood sugar levels anyway? Okay, so when we talk about blood sugar levels, usually the metric we try to use, um, or that is used in a lab value, I specifically don't use them, but that is used in a lab value, is a fasting glucose reading, okay? So this is in milligrams per deciliter of glucose or sugar actually in your bloodstream. You can get this through a finger prick, you can also get this uh, just when your blood is drawn at the doctor's office in the morning if you ever have to fast going into your blood work. That's usually why they want to get a fasting glucose reading. Um, so 99 or below of this number is considered normal. And fasting is relative. Usually if you um, just don't eat anything after you get up in the morning this is going to be okay for a fasting glucose reading so you don't need to fast for like days on end um, 100 to 125 is going to be what we would consider pre-diabetes and then 126 or higher than that is diabetes and this is usually a value that would be taken over a few different days few different times especially if you are somebody who's in that pre-diabetic or higher diabetes range so they're not just going to immediately say, oh yeah, this person, um, he has 125, right, milligrams per deciliter on his uh, blood glucose reading. So he has prediabetes. It very well likely could be happening. What they would do though is that would kind of just be a red flag into we need to follow up on this and see what's really going on. And um, on top of that, once you kind of just know the general readings, some of the other things that you might actually notice from hyperglycemia, which is high blood sugar, that's just another name for it. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is a decent amount of things though. Uh, you might notice that you have some increased thirst. You might have a dry mouth, so you just feel like you need to um, almost quench that thirst with your dry mouth, of course. Um, on the flip side, since you have increased thirst, you are also going to need to pee a lot. So you're gonna have this constant need to uh, feel like you're going to pee. Unexplained tiredness. So if you're not able to um, use that glucose in your bloodstream effectively, guess what? You're not gonna have a lot of energy. This may lead to some unexplained tiredness as well. Uh, one of the other things that does happen with individuals with hyperglycemia is some vision changes as well. So this is a really interesting thing because a lot of people don't realize that um, when you have high blood sugar, this can damage your nerves. So for a lot of people, they'll get some nerve issues uh, specifically through their entire body. So maybe neuropathy, but on all of the nerves in your eyes too. So a lot of times when you get eye checks, they can actually see diabetes forming before it even happens. So just another good reason to make sure you get your eyes checked, even if you don't wear glasses like me, um, I'm a nerd of course, but <laughs> um, even if you don't wear glasses, it's still a good thing to go ahead and check on in. 
Unintentional weight loss or weight gain. So if you are not um, getting the proper glucose in your bloodstream, you might um, be losing weight very quickly and you also could be gaining weight very quickly. Um, basically just unintentional fluctuations in your weight that you just can't explain. Um, frequent infections. So this is just something along the lines of uh, your body is not able to uh, use all of that energy to um, kind of help to fight off infections um, and your body's just not able to use the energy very efficiently to do anything in your body so if you think about it your immune system is going to be highly compromised because of that and some of the infections um, are a little more common than the others i don't know particularly which one's off the top of my head this isn't uh, exactly in my scope, um, but just know that your immune system is going to be compromised a little bit. Another really interesting thing about this and um, a fruity smelling breath. So this is uh, something that I would say it's kind of subjective. Like I, I don't really know what a fruity smelling breath uh, could be like. Of course, like I like bananas and I like apples, but I don't think it's just going to literally smell like bananas or apples, uh, depending on what kind of fruit it is. But if you just notice kind of an unpleasant odor, uh, just a different type of odor in your breath, it very well could be some of the symptoms of diabetes coming on. And this isn't to say that, you know, one day you pee a lot or you have unexplained tiredness one day, um, or maybe, you know, your vision is just a little off. This is not saying that you immediately have diabetes, right? These are just some common symptoms that if you have them reoccurring over a long period of time, it's probably a good idea maybe to talk to your doctor um, and or just go to the store and you can get one of those blood prick, uh, blood prick readings that will allow you to uh, kind of see where your blood sugar is at. The interesting thing about both of these um, or all of these different symptoms is that they can be present in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. There isn't really like a specific uh, set of symptoms that would work for just type 1 or type 2. And um, type 1 is of course that genetic variation where uh, the cells in your pancreas just simply aren't able to uh, produce insulin. Type 2 is where you have so much blood sugar in your body that your body can't actually produce enough insulin to lower it. So uh, in both of those different variations, it doesn't really matter when it comes to overall symptoms. So go ahead and like the video so far if you have learned something new from this and have gained a few actionable uh, items on uh, things to look out for when it comes to diabetes prevention. On top of that, we can also prevent diabetes uh, by looking at some of the long-term uh, dangers of uncontrolled blood sugar. So I think one of the best prevention strategies is actually looking at some of the issues that might actually happen if you are not being aware of all of the things that could um, just be present with uncontrolled blood sugar. So one of the interesting things that I learned recently is that when it comes to high blood sugar, there is actually an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And the mechanism behind this, I'm not fully sure on, but one of the interesting statistics that I came across in a recent study is that every single time your blood sugar spikes to a point that is way above baseline, this increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. And I would assume it has something along the lines to that anytime you can't control blood sugar in your body, you're not able to get appropriate energy to different uh, areas uh, that your body essentially needs to get energy from. So that energy kind of dysregulation, I would assume is one of the reasons it could increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. Also, we know that individuals with cardiovascular disease, or excuse me, with diabetes or uncontrolled blood sugar usually aren't eating the healthiest of foods to begin with. They're usually overeating as well. So both of those things when put together can be a high uh, increased risk of that cardiovascular disease. Uh, another interesting thing about high blood sugar is that there can be some nerve damage from um, having high blood sugar 
in your overall body and this can cause a whole cascade of issues including um, poor circulation maybe some neuropathy we'll actually talk about that in a second um, but the the nerve damage isn't just to one specific area it can literally be through the entire area of your body so just something to be aware of if you um, are trying to um, stay away from actually getting diabetes uh, nerve damage is one of the many reasons to uh, try to keep your blood sugar in check on top of that kidney damage is another issue so um, when you over consume on sugar your kidneys need to work extra hard to filter out all of that excess sugar from your bloodstream and ultimately it gets put into your urine um, that's part of the reason why when you are diabetic you need to pee a lot um, is because you're literally excreting a lot of that extra sugar through your urine your body's not using it it's getting literally peed out um, so your kidneys take quite its hole because of this exact reason on top of that we just talked about some kind of nerve damage issues when it comes to some uncontrolled uh, blood sugar complications so uh, the next uh, couple actually specifically are very very focused on that nerve damage so going blind and when i say going blind that's kind of a drastic thing right um, but vision changes are incredibly common in individuals with high blood sugar so if you are not managing your blood sugar efficiently the uh, nerves in your eye aren't able to work very well and this is where you hear the term diabetic um, retinopathy essentially those nerves in your eyes are just getting killed off they're completely just getting zilched off by all that extra sugar in your bloodstream and because of that a lot of individuals have vision problems and if it gets really bad you can literally go blind from it so just something to realize on top of that sticking with that nerve dysregulation uh, or i should say the nerve damage that happens from uncontrolled blood sugar you will also potentially have some foot problems so you might notice that there's some numbness there's some tingling in your feet um, and for a lot of individuals this is actually just from poor circulation so if your nerves aren't able to run as effectively um, through your lower body your lower body already has a tough time as it is getting proper circulation so when you add on that extra layer of the nerves being damaged from high blood sugar it makes it even more tougher um, to circulate that body or uh, circulate the blood through those lower extremities so lots of foot problems you'll hear um, people have foot pain uh, maybe they won't even be able to feel their feet there's a lot of different things that could happen from it um, on top of that teeth and gum infections this is something that was new to me uh, but if you are uh, constantly having high blood sugar I guess it would make sense in the fact that if you're like having cavities and stuff from always eating a bunch of sugar um, then that would make sense but actually having high blood sugar uh, the mechanism behind that and actually leading you to have teeth and gum infections that could simply be along the lines of your body just not uh, maintaining homeostasis quite as good um, and running all the processes quite as well so that's potentially my look at it uh, but teeth and gum infections can happen chronic fatigue of course if your body's not able to take that blood sugar that's in your body and shuttle it towards all your cells shuttle it towards your muscle you will not feel good not only will you not feel good you will not feel energetic you will not feel like you want to take on any tasks throughout the day um, the, the tough part about this is it, on the flip side of having low blood sugar it's actually kind of uh, similar in that regard of when you have low blood sugar you're also not gonna feel good you're probably gonna feel very tired uh, so both high blood sugar and low sugar can kind of both have that same kind of um, overall mechanism of seeing that and then just weight gain and weight loss so if you are not controlling your blood sugar effectively 
you might be gaining a lot of extra weight and you also could potentially be losing a lot of extra weight. Neither of these are a good thing. I know what you're thinking right away. Um, oh, that's great. I'm just going to have high blood sugar and I'm going to lose a bunch of weight. Well, this is not healthy. Um, and in either of these cases, it's simply because your body is not utilizing the energy properly. It's not using the energy properly. Um, and when that happens, you can ultimately lead to a lot of cascading issues. Um, so lots of kind of scary dangers up there of uncontrolled blood sugar. So make sure even if you are somebody who's healthy and you want to avoid having this happen to you, highly recommend to uh, make sure your blood sugar levels are okay. Eating that uh, health promoting diet, we know that keeps blood sugar levels in check. Like the video so far if you have gained some valuable knowledge from it. And we will dive into our next topic. So this next topic is going to clear up some stuff on diabetes. And I just wanted to go over the difference between type one and type two diabetes. Cause a lot of times people will talk to me and say, um, oh yeah, I got uh, type two diabetes and there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. Well, that's not completely the case. Um, so let's dive into the difference between these two. So very simply, Type 1 diabetes is usually what we would consider a genetic type of diabetes. So when I say genetic, I mean that typically you are either born with this or it develops at some point um, because of your gene sequencing, right? All the genes in your body will signal certain things to happen. Um, and what's happening and essentially the genetic part of this is that the cells in your pancreas just don't produce any insulin, okay? So when we think about managing our blood sugar, insulin, when it is secreted by the pancreas, is what helps to lower your blood sugar, lower the blood sugar in your body. So if you have too much blood sugar, if you have too much sugar in your bloodstream, I should say, insulin secreted and insulin will help then to shuttle that uh, blood sugar to your uh, respective tissues that need it it's going to help you uh, manage that blood sugar and keep it stable but when you have type 1 diabetes your pancreas effectively is not working it's non-functional in the case of getting insulin from it so the good thing about this is that there can be some management with insulin or different drugs. Um, I have some people in my family that uh, are actually type one diabetic and they just have to take insulin shots throughout the day. The really cool thing about this, especially nowadays, is that they're actually starting to get really, really good with the technology for individuals who are uh, not only type one diabetic, but also type two, where they have an insulin pump actually shoved into their body and what happens is every now and again you have to um, put some insulin in it but you don't have to take a shot every day essentially that insulin whenever you want to you can just tap a button and it will release into your body so uh, some cool kind of technological things coming out of that for individuals who are trying to manage their overall blood sugar um, so the management, usually insulin and drugs. Uh, on the flip side, type 2 diabetes, this is what is usually considered in kind of the health sphere as lifestyle diabetes. And I should say, you probably, actually I'm sure you could have um, a little bit of both to begin with, like you could have uh, type 2 and then you realize a few years down the road you actually have type one. Um, type one is something that can develop. Uh, my family member actually didn't have it uh, until he was a little bit younger. He was diagnosed, uh, I think when he was in his like adolescence. So this isn't something that literally when you're a baby you might have when it comes to type one, it can develop. But back to type two, uh, type two is gonna be that lifestyle intervention. So this is going to be somebody who chronically overeats on sugar, chronically doesn't exercise, and just ultimately does all the things that uh, will make your blood sugar incredibly crazy. 
So uh, sleep is another big thing too. If you want uh, poor blood sugar regulation, make sure to have the worst sleep as possible and have really, really high uh, stress in your life. And what happens in this variation of uh, type two diabetes, I should say, is that you become insulin resistant, okay? So we call type two diabetes insulin resistance. And the interesting thing about this is that your body is still producing insulin. It's actually very efficient and it produces a lot of insulin. A lot of insulin because you are consuming so much extra sugar in your body. And when you consume all of this extra sugar in your body, what happens is your body can't produce enough insulin. Your body literally becomes resistant to insulin. So if there's too much glucose in your body, your body isn't able to respond and use that glucose effectively. And that is an incredibly huge issue because when it comes to getting that blood sugar um, down for one, but also using and utilizing all that energy for the different respective uh, processes in our body, it's going to become incredibly irregular. So uh, type two, again, is going to be that kind of lifestyle variation. Um, either of them basically can lead to uh, blood glucose levels not being in an effective level, but type one is literally because your pancreas can't produce insulin. Type two is because your pancreas is producing too much insulin and your body just isn't able to uh, lower that blood sugar because um, it becomes essentially resistant to insulin, resistant to what insulin is trying to do, hence the term insulin resistance. So if you learned something new from that section, go ahead and give this video a like so far if it gave you some good value. Uh, next topic we can look at is exercise and blood sugar levels. So if you are trying to get the most out of your blood sugar management, you need to stick to exercise as a primary modality to do exactly this. So this is some really cool stuff here. Uh, make sure to watch this all the way to the end um, because exercise can literally change the game. It's, it's almost like taking uh, a blood sugar medication, right? So, Exercise can help with blood sugar levels in two different ways. The first way we look at is with cardiovascular exercise or cardio. So uh, what cardio does is that it can burn calories or burn energy in the immediate term. So if you go out for a run, you will burn energy, um, usually either a little bit of glycogen or just sugar in your bloodstream. So if you're thinking about someone um, or some maybe yourself and you're like, I really need to lower my blood sugar right now, guess what? Go for a run. You will literally take pretty much all of the sugar that is in your bloodstream and that will be utilized towards exercise. So that's getting burned off. That's getting used as energy. Uh, this can help to blow, uh, lower blood sugar incredibly fast if you do have a very large spike. Um, and even just something like a 10 minute walk can actually monitor and manage your blood sugar pretty well. There's a lot of studies on this, how just a 10 minute walk after a meal can actually help to monitor and lower your blood sugar just as much as if you took metformin. And if you aren't familiar, metformin is a pill that is often given to uh, individuals who have diabetes to help uh, monitor and manage their blood sugar. So if you are doing cardiovascular exercise though to lower your blood sugar, I do want to give a warning though, uh, individuals with diabetes should monitor this because sometimes you can go on the complete flip opposite side of this and do too much exercise which will lead you to being hypoglycemic or uh, having a low blood sugar which has a whole host of issues associated with it as well. So uh, this is definitely something where you'll have to listen to your body. You might even need to, when you are doing this, make sure that you um, 
have a blood sugar monitoring thing, maybe a continuous glucose monitor on you, or just doing a blood prick uh, before you work out to actually see how much your blood sugar levels actually are, because that's going to make a huge, huge difference in the long run. Uh, on top of that, doing weight training is incredibly potent at helping to manage your overall blood sugar levels. Now, this is really cool stuff, and uh, just another reason that people, you, you need, you need, you need, you need to start resistance training if you aren't today. So, just another reason, but when you build muscle, and it doesn't have to be a lot of muscle, but when you build muscle beyond your baseline, beyond what um, you have if you're just sitting and doing nothing most of the day, if you build a little bit of muscle through resistance training, your body becomes more insulin sensitive. And that is a wonderful thing. If we think about becoming insulin sensitive, this essentially means that your body needs less insulin produced and secreted by the pancreas to actually lower your blood sugar. So your pancreas does not have to work as hard. So if we think about the complete opposite of that side, insulin resistance is when your pancreas cannot produce enough insulin to actually lower your blood sugar. Your body becomes resistant to it. So we're trying to do the complete opposite here. Resistance training can build um, more insulin sensitivity and it does this by building muscle and that muscle actually soaks up the glucose like a sponge. So a lot of times when you build some good muscle, your insulin doesn't have to work as hard as in basically you're not needing to secrete as much to lower your blood sugar because that muscle is basically taking it and saying, thanks, thanks for that energy. I'm, I'm taking this, we're good to go, which is really awesome. And the other really awesome thing about this is that that muscle works 24 seven to do this. So when you're sleeping, when you're sitting and doing nothing, uh, of course, when you're working out and actually using the muscle, but even if you're just sitting and watching some Netflix on TV, your body is still, your muscle is still soaking up that uh, energy. And this is of course, assuming that you do consistently practice resistance training through your entire life. You uh, can't just uh, work out for a little bit and uh, build some muscle and be like, oh, that's good to go. It's going to last forever. No, you need to be consistent with this. Um, having muscle mass consistently on your body will lead to the most potent long-term benefits when it comes to improving your overall uh, blood glucose regulation. So uh, cardio and weights together one of the best forms of uh, holistic medicine that you can be implementing to hopefully reduce the amount of blood sugar fluctuations in your overall day. So go ahead and give this video a like so far if that provided some value from you. And if you learned something new about that, I think the weight training thing is really, really cool. Let's now look at what a good diet might be for somebody with blood sugar control. Now, there's a lot of different things going on on the internet out there of like, oh, this diet's good, that diet's good. So let's dive into um, some good dieting practices to monitor your blood sugar control. Now, when we talk about blood sugar, one of the first things that people usually reference and think of is this term glycemic index. It gets thrown around a lot. So let's talk about glycemic index. Glycemic index simply means how much one food spikes your blood sugar. How much one food spikes your blood sugar? It isn't a meal, it's literally one food, okay? So this measurement is simply given in a value of a whole number. So uh, if we look down on the list here, we can see a potato has a 78. That's actually a pretty high glycemic index. Pineapple, a little bit less at 59. And an apple is 36. So all of those uh, are considered what I would consider, you know, whole healthy foods, but all of them have a very large array of um, ways that it actually messes with your blood sugar. So that potato is spiking your blood sugar quite a bit more than if you just ate an apple. And of course, when you do this, 
it is just from that specific food. This is not if you eat a potato with steak, that's going to change your blood sugar levels tremendously. That's not if you eat a pineapple in a smoothie, that's going to change your blood sugar uh, levels tremendously. This is just from one simple food, only eating the food together. Now, when it comes to making healthy decisions, I just want you to realize that glycemic index isn't everything, simply meaning that the lower the glycemic index, the better the food is uh, just in general. So if you think about um, ice cream, for example, ice cream has a glycemic index of 51, okay? So kind of a moderate range of glycemic index. Instant oatmeal, so a little bit more processed than uh, whole rolled oats, but instant oats or quick oats, has a blood sugar spiking um, capability or a glycemic index of 78. So much higher of a glycemic index than ice cream. I would never recommend somebody who's diabetic though or trying to monitor their blood sugar to eat ice cream over oatmeal. You might just simply need to do um, what we're gonna talk about in this next section is layer in some of those um, carbs with different things because if you are eating ice cream, there's not only carbs in it and sugar, there's also fat in it. And when you combine macronutrients like that, that will lower the overall blood sugar spike on your body. So this idea of naked carbs um, will greatly spike your blood sugar. So um, just eating bread is going to spike your blood sugar a lot more than if you eat a sandwich that has some vegetables on it which have fiber and will lower your blood sugar or stabilize your blood sugar and also has some protein which will help to stabilize that blood sugar a little bit more so eating stuff together will actually help to keep your blood sugar a little more in check um, so make sure if you are somebody who's diabetic that maybe you are trying to eat um, less carbs that are quote unquote naked and trying to find ways to pair them with food. Also too, you gotta keep in mind, carbs that have no fiber attached to them are going to spike your blood sugar quite a bit more because that fiber naturally slows the digestive process. And when you slow your digestive process, of course, it's going to uh, lead you to not spiking your blood sugar quite as much um, simply because your body can't utilize it as quickly. It doesn't get into your body as quickly. It doesn't get absorbed as quickly. And that's a great reason to have stuff that's high in fiber. So orange juice, for example, has basically all the same nutrients as an orange, but there's literally zero fiber in it. So that orange, when you eat the orange, it does have a little bit of fiber. That's going to lower your blood sugar and keep it a little more stable than that orange juice. This is why orange juice and I guess specifically when we're talking about a liquid calorie soda is so bad for you because literally the second you consume that, it spikes your blood sugar right away. It spikes it almost immediately and you're essentially getting zero nutrients from it other than the calories. Um, so not good for weight loss, not good for uh, keeping your blood sugar levels healthy. Now, just some general guidelines that would probably be good for you if you are uh, trying to find the best diet for yourself. Um, eating smaller meals, the smaller the meal is, the less uh, spike of a blood sugar it's gonna have on you. I would try to eat lower carb in general when you are not exercising. When you are exercising, your body is able to take those carbs and utilize it as energy and fuel pretty readily and pretty quickly. But when you are not exercising, um, especially if you are somebody who's diabetic, um, it might be a little bit more advantageous for you to stick to just lower carb options because you don't have to worry about that blood sugar spike quite as much. Um, but if you are going to eat some foods that are higher in carb, just try to eat them together with something that maybe has a little bit of fat and ideally a little bit of protein. That's going to help to monitor and lower that blood sugar as well. When it comes to actually drinks and having treats, I would recommend sticking to some sugar-free options, um, sugar-free juices, uh, sugar-free Gatorades, for example, diet sodas, those are all good options for somebody who's trying to keep their blood sugar levels in check and not have them um, consistently spiking up and down throughout the day. Uh, 
Higher fiber foods are incredibly potent at lowering and keeping your blood sugar in check. So fruits and vegetables, of course, uh, there's some cereals and whole grains that are also very high in fiber. You can get in some beans, uh, so black beans, pinto beans, garbanzo beans, all those beans are very high in fiber. And even though they are high in carbs, they're high in fiber. They're also high in protein as well. So they will not spike your blood sugar nearly as much as again, let's say you're just you know drinking or chugging a bunch of orange juice, that's gonna spike your blood sugar tremendously. Another great hack that you can use is to um, really take advantage of all the lower carb options and treats that are out there nowadays. So there are pancakes and cookies and um, all these different treats that you can find that are actually lower carb, uh, which is really, really cool because it's not gonna spike your blood sugar quite as much. The thing about all of these different foods though is that they usually will take less carbs from the formula. And when they engineer these foods, they will add extra fat in place of the carbs. So these foods aren't necessarily gonna be healthier, <laughs> okay? Uh, what they do do though is to lower the overall carbs. So they're still very high in calories. Uh, there's something you should eat sparingly and of course not eating all the time because if you do eat these all the time, your weight is going to go up quite a bit because you're overeating on calories and we know that keeping a healthy weight is one of the best ways to make sure your blood sugar levels are in check long term. Another thing that you can do for yourself is to try out a CGM or a co continuous glucose monitor. So this is a really cool piece of equipment that is basically attached to uh, your body, your shoulder. And what it does is it, hence the term, continuous glucose monitor. It literally monitors your glucose levels all the time, 24 seven, which is really, really neat because when you're trying out all these different foods, you may notice that uh, for you, potato, we'll go back to the top example, doesn't actually spike your blood sugar quite that much, just for whatever reason your body doesn't do it. But an apple might actually spike your blood sugar a tremendous amount. So all of these glycemic index numbers are averages based off of a bunch of different studies, but everyone is their own individual species. Uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day where somebody told me, um, or when I was listening to it, they said that baby carrots spike their blood sugar almost as much as eating some ice cream. So those little individual differences make a huge profound difference long term. And um, getting a continuous glucose monitor is a really, really good way to do that. I'm kind of on the fence. I really want to get one of these. I uh, just haven't fully... Uh, put that in the time to get it, but um, this is where you can really experiment with yourself, which I think is fun. Go ahead and give this video a like if it has provided you some value so far and giving you some good tools and tricks that you can use in your diet to keep your blood sugar levels in check. So let's talk about some of the best supplements that you can use to help lower your blood sugar and keep it under control. And I will say, um, I would consult with a physician before you take any of these. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list. There are quite a few more. These are just a few that I think were notable uh, when I was doing my research. So the first one's gonna be berberine. Uh, berberine is a supplement that can potentially improve your insulin sensitivity. So when we talk about monitoring and managing your blood glucose levels quite a bit, having improved insulin sensitivity uh, is incredibly important because the more sensitive your body is to insulin, the less insulin your body is going to essentially need to secrete to actually lower your blood sugar. So uh, when we talk about insulin resistance, that's type two diabetes. What happens with type two diabetes is that your body produces too much insulin uh, because it can never lower the blood sugar. So berberine can actually kind of do the exact opposite potentially. Uh, at least in these initial studies. I know berberine has a lot of good uh, information behind it and good studies behind it. American ginseng uh, may help to improve the body's insulin secretion. 
So if you are somebody who uh, maybe struggles with your your blood sugar levels uh, being too high, it might be because your body is not able to secrete enough insulin. Uh, typically, this isn't usually the case. Um, but if you are somebody who's type one diabetic um, or just kind of borderline pre-diabetic. Uh, this could be a way if you do take some of this to increase that insulin secretion uh, and when you do increase um, the insulin secretion through your pancreas your body can naturally lower your blood sugar through that exact process cinnamon and this is great for me because i love cinnamon use cinnamon a lot uh, it can actually help the body cells uh, better respond to insulin so you become a little more insulin sensitive uh, similar to berberine and again, when you become insulin sensitive, your body is essentially able to uh, use less insulin to actually shuttle that blood sugar and that blood glucose where it needs to go. Now, when it comes to uh, vitamin D, vitamin D can help to improve the function of the pancreatic cells. So this may be similar to uh, the American ginseng where um, if you're taking vitamin D, it can basically allow you to maybe uh, increase the rate of your insulin production, which is incredibly uh, potent at lowering and monitoring your overall blood sugar levels. Uh, gymnemia, gymnemia, gymnema. <laughs> I'm not sure on that one. Um, it's got kind of an interesting name there, but uh, gymnemia, uh, this can help to reduce sugar absorption, which I guess inherently could lower your blood sugar. It would lower your blood sugar, but this might not be the best thing to do long term because if you're reducing sugar absorption, you are going to need to get rid of that sugar through some way. And that might be through just peeing more. Uh, it could be potentially through some diarrhea, I'm even thinking. Uh, and if you're reducing the sugar absorption, it's not being absorbed, hence you're not getting all that energy. So maybe not the best supplement, but still something you could consider in conjunction, again, as you talk with your doctor uh, about taking this maybe with your um, diabetes medication. Uh, magnesium can also help to um, produce more uh, normal insulin levels uh, more normal insulin secretion levels, I should say, in the pancreas. So if you're not getting enough magnesium, it could lead to impaired pancreatic function. Go ahead and give this video a like if that provided some value for you and gave you some good tools and ideas. Um, I definitely would not recommend doing all of these as this could greatly uh, mess with your blood sugar levels, but you could just try something out. And again, of course, talking with your physician is incredibly important before you try any of these disclaimer there so something that all of us deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is stress something that a lot of us need to do on a day-to-day -day basis but don't is sleep and guess what both of these have a profound effect on your blood sugar levels so when it comes to stress chronically elevated cortisol Cortisol is what we'd consider our stress hormone. Chronically elevated cortisol levels can lead to glucose being liberated. And that might sound great. Glucose is liberated. I'm always able to uh, get energy, right? Um, but when glucose is always liberated through this chronic stress, uh, basically, cortisol is telling you to um, release glucose, release energy, because we need it. We need to be focused, right? When that happens long term, if you think about it, you are literally, literally having high blood sugar in your level all the time, right? That's exactly um, what high blood sugar is. So the cortisol is telling you we need energy now. But if it's chronically elevated, you're always needing energy now, which can ultimately lead to diabetes and insulin resistance. Because if you always have cortisol um, being secreted in your body and it's telling you we need more energy, we need glucose in our bloodstream right now, your pancreas is going to be on overdrive. And when your pancreas is on overdrive and is producing so much insulin that it ultimately cannot even keep up with it that's when we lead to insulin resistance where 
no matter the amount of insulin that your body is secreting, it will not be able to lower the blood sugar. It basically becomes useless for your body, okay? So this is not a good thing. And sleep can make this much worse because it can increase your cortisol levels. <laughs> so if you're already stressed out, making sure you get enough sleep is incredibly crucial. Um, another way that sleep can actually affect blood sugar levels, and this isn't directly through um, cortisol, but it's actually through dysregulated appetite. So when you sleep less and don't get enough sleep, I should say, your body increases the hunger hormones that are created and it also decreases the fullness hormones that are created. So when both of those are happening at the same time, your stress hormones are going to go up. You're going to always feel hungry and you're never going to feel nearly as full. Does that sound like a recipe for disaster when it comes to monitoring your overall health and blood sugar? I sure as heck think so. So getting enough sleep, ideally seven hours. I try to get people to do a little bit more than that um, because usually when you're in bed, if you think about it, if you go in bed for seven hours, usually you're tossing, you're turning for a little bit. It takes you some time to actually fall asleep. You're not actually going to be getting a full amount of sleep in that time. So that's why it's incredibly important. Um, I, you know, again, usually tell people try to get eight hours in bed so then you're at least sleeping seven hours i'm usually in bed for about nine and a half hours um because i'm really at a point in my life where i appreciate and really really make sleep a priority um and i just feel awful if i don't do that and uh hopefully this video gave you a little bit of guidance on why you should absolutely do the same thing um being stressed is not good for your blood sugar but also not sleeping. It's not good for your stress and for your blood sugar because you're gonna be eating a bunch of food um, which can make your levels not good at all. So monitor your stress, get some good sleep, like the video if this provided some good value from you. So you're probably wondering why in the world, as a healthy person, do I need to worry about my blood sugar? I'm fine, I feel good, right? I should be able to eat what I want when I want. Well, um, let's be honest here. If you have that exact same frame of reference and same mindset, you will not be healthy very longer. Because when you think about what makes somebody healthy, this is from typically the absence of disease, having good energy, not needing medications, and then also just having a good quality of life. They're able to do all the different things that they want to do with no problems at all. So when we think about somebody with dysregulated blood sugar, are they healthy? I would say no, because for a lot of these people, they need medications to get on. They're usually not full of energy. And having dysregulated blood sugar is essentially diabetes or can potentially be the start of diabetes. And that is absolutely not the absence of disease. So if you are healthy right now, I'm sure you want to stay healthy, which is one of the most important reasons to monitor your blood sugar levels and eat appropriately, of course. So not overeating on too much sugar at one time, uh, making sure you're getting consistent exercise, uh, both weight training and cardiovascular exercise, because both of those when paired together are incredibly potent at uh, lowering your overall blood sugar, or at least I should say monitoring your blood sugar. But I think this idea of um, just staying healthy, staying where we're at is probably the most uh, potent thing to think about, right? Um, should I say, do healthy people need to worry about um, not getting cancer? Of course, you would do all the different lifestyle activities to not get cancer. Um, do healthy people need to worry about uh, getting lung cancer? Yes, yes, healthy people shouldn't just go and smoke cigarettes and thinking I'm healthy now, so I'm never going to get lung cancer, so I'm gonna smoke, right? Um, 
do healthy people need to worry about um, developing um, fatty alcohol disease when it comes to um, fatty liver alcohol disease? Yes. So doing these things that are preventative to hopefully get you to not be to that point and stay healthy as long term is incredibly important. The logic is same for blood sugar as well. There's also an interesting thing about um, blood sugar levels. Even if you do have healthy blood sugar levels now, every time you spike your blood sugar, this is really interesting, your risk for developing cardiovascular disease actually goes up. Every time it spikes, your risk goes up. So that's not really good news uh, if you're thinking about trying to live the, the healthiest life for yourself because you may be healthy now, but if you're constantly spiking your blood sugar, even if your blood sugar levels remain pretty consistent and pretty uh, clear throughout your entire life, you are increasing your chances of cardiovascular disease, which of course, as we know, is also something that makes you not healthy. And um, I should say when I'm talking about these two that at some point we will all probably develop something like this, but this is from premature death, developing these things early. We're trying to uh, do all of these different things uh, we just talked about to um, be the healthiest for the longest that we can be. Some people are genetically gifted. It can be healthier, longer with doing less lifestyle stuff. Some people need to work a little bit harder and you'll probably uh, know about yourself if you're somebody who can quote unquote get away with things. Um, but just realize that um, we're just doing what we can to monitor that blood sugar. So go ahead and give this video a like so far if it's given you some value. And this is gonna be a fun one. Let's look at some easy tricks and easy hacks to lower your blood sugar incredibly fast. These are things you can do throughout the day. Um, maybe you can do after the meal, but the first thing is just going for a walk before, during, or after eating. This can be as potent to keep your blood sugar levels in check as metformin. And metformin is a drug that is taken by individuals who are diabetic, um, or sometimes even individuals who are not diabetic. This is kind of the new thing that's coming on the scene. Um, but essentially, uh, it's as effective as that blood sugar lowering medication from taking a walk before, during, or after. And you might be wondering, during a meal? What? Um, I will sometimes get on my treadmill and put it at a really low speed and just start walking and just start walking. Um, usually I don't have a huge meal, right? Like big steak and potatoes, but it's like a, a wrap or some fruit with yogurt, right? Um, when I do this, I know that I'm keeping my blood sugar levels pretty stable throughout the thing because a lot of that food I'm eating is going right into uh, the exercise, quote unquote, or the, the physical activity that I'm doing right then. On top of that, Drinking 8 to 16 ounces of water, just boom, right off the bat, no problem, can actually help to keep your blood sugar levels in check. So if this is something where if you are really, really high on blood sugar, just pounding back some water, not too much, you don't want to uh, go through water intoxication, but just 8, um, ideally probably 16 ounces of water will lower your blood sugar pretty quickly. Um, when you are eating a meal that's high in carbs, Make sure to just eat other foods with it. When you combine other foods together with a high carb meal, you are actually uh, lowering the overall effect that that carb will have on spiking your blood sugar. So instead of just eating a potato, you would ideally eat a potato with some, uh, I should say like non-starchy vegetables, so carrots or broccoli and maybe some protein because not only is that fiber from the non-starchy vegetables going to lower your blood sugar and keep it in check, but also that protein is, when combined with the non-starchy vegetables and that carb is going to greatly diminish the effects that it has on your overall blood sugar. So um, on top of that, if you are eating all of those things together, if you just eat your vegetables and your protein first and then your carbs last, you're really, really, really going to lower the overall blood sugar spike. And 
you know, this isn't something that sometimes a lot of people want to do because they like the taste of all these different things together and I get that. So if you are eating those things together, try to literally eat them together instead of what most people do is if they're eating, um, let's say they have potatoes. A lot of people go for the carb first because that kind of tastes the best. Um, and they'll leave, you know, just a little bit of veggies in their corner and uh, maybe they'll get to that. Maybe they'll, they'll have those veggies. Um, sometimes they don't, but um, veggies first is a really, really good hack. Also, just de-stressing. Uh, if your cortisol levels, your stress hormone levels are chronically elevated, this will tell your body it needs to liberate energy. And when you are constantly needing to liberate energy, guess what? That literally is blood sugar um, getting raised. Your body is saying, hey, we need energy, energy, energy. We need to be alert because we're stressed right now. That's going to greatly increase your blood sugar. So um, de-stressing and doing things like uh, meditation. Um, you can just talk to a friend. Any way that de-stressing um, works for you and works easily in your life is a great way to uh, lower your blood sugar. Intermittent fasting, this is a really cool one. So if you're not familiar with intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting is essentially where you only are eating about eight hours of the day. For most people, they'll do a 16 hour fast and an eight hour feeding window. Uh, so how this usually looks for a lot of people is their feeding window will usually be about 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. Maybe it'll be about 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. There's no really magical number about this. It's just the fact that they're skipping their first meal. They are not eating when they first wake up in the morning. And that is incredibly crucial because a lot of times when people wake up in the morning and they eat, they eat high sugar stuff. They eat a muffin with some orange juice or some oatmeal with a banana and no protein. And when all of this is done together, you're literally setting your day up for failure from the beginning because you're spiking your blood sugar, which can then lead to crashes and ups and downs and back and forth throughout the entire rest of the day. So um, when you are thinking about intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting is a way that your body can get used to actually monitoring your blood glucose levels without eating food. So you're giving yourself a break in your digestive system but it's also really cool too because your body is going to need to then tap into your fat burning stores um, for energy and it's going to become more metabolically flexible where it can use fat very easily. It can also use glucose very easily. And after you do this for a long time, you'll notice you can go longer without eating food and you won't even really feel like it. Uh, and at times you might actually feel more energetic, which I think is a super neat thing that can come from it. Um, on top of that, uh, one tablespoon of vinegar uh, in a small glass before every meal. This is something that, of course, would not really taste the best, but hey, maybe you're into that type of stuff or you just, just sit back. Um, but vinegar or apple cider vinegar, sometimes people like that. Um, both of those have some pretty decent uh, data on keeping your blood sugar levels when you're um, about to eat a meal, pretty consistent and um, not spiking it too much. So a little bit of vinegar goes a long way. Uh, and then starting the day savory. Uh, so when you start the day savory, this essentially means that you are eating something like eggs and maybe some avocado for breakfast, or you are eating um, some chicken breast with some cheese and maybe a little bit of uh, some greens for breakfast. Uh, those are just a few examples, not an exhaustive list, of course. But when you start the day savory, you're starting out with your day being a good constant stream of blood glucose, not too much, but it's a constant stream with that little bit of meal. Um, that's not going to raise your blood sugar too much, which will keep your energy good throughout the day and also keep your blood sugar levels more stable. Because if you think about it, when you eat something that's really high in sugar, you spike it. You spike your blood sugar and then it goes down, you crash, you feel tired. So you're gonna to wanna to eat more to spike, crash, spike, crash. And then your sleep is all messed up and then essentially this is the uh, hamster wheel that a lot of people are spinning on for their entire life and they can't get out of. So sometimes just eating a savory breakfast to start out the day is one of the hacks you can do. Um, and I should say for all of these two, you don't need to do all of them. It's kind of finding what works the best for you. 
So I don't start my day savory. I eat some Greek yogurt with a fruit. I don't do the tablespoon of vinegar in a glass before every meal, but I do intermittent fast. I usually uh, wake up at about 6.30 to 7 every morning, and then I don't eat my first meal until about usually between 10 and 11, sometimes noon or even longer. Uh, so I'm fasting at least 14 to 15 hours every day. And um, I should say intermittent fasting. So I skip my breakfast, basically. I don't eat right when I wake up. Um, I walk a lot throughout the day. And I also usually try to walk when I'm eating those smaller meals. Uh, when I'm eating my meals, I usually eat vegetables first and then protein after. Uh, I try to combine all my meals and I try to limit eating naked carbs or just carbs by themselves unless I am about to go work out and know that all of that energy from those carbohydrates are going to get shuttled directly into my muscles. So um, again, I do a few of these. I don't do all of them though because some of them I just don't wanna do. Um, and I think it's about finding the ones that work the best for you. So go ahead and give this video a like if it provided some value from you. Uh, and feel free subscribing to our channel as we help individuals of all abilities improve their overall health and knowledge of the gym regardless of where they are currently at in their overall fitness journey and once you're done watching this video go ahead and check out the video in the pinned comment that talks about a few dieting hacks and dieting secrets that individuals who are skinny use literally all the time and can help to keep you lean year round as well so go ahead and check those out thanks for watching